So sometimes the problem that we think we have isn't really the problem that we actually have. Uh, in 1950s France, there was this doctor named Alfred Tomati, and he was an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat specialist. And he started to have a lot of clients that were opera singers, because his dad was an opera singer, so he would send these clients over to Alfred, and they started to have the same problem. And so uh, it was that they couldn't hit notes that were normally within their singing range. And so they sought out Alfred's help, and they asked him, hey, can you look at our vocal cords, tell us what's going on uh, with our singing so that we can hit these notes again. And so after examining their vocal cords for some time, Alfred started to realize, I don't think that this is the problem that they think. And so he devised this experiment uh, to try and diagnose what was really going on. And so he used an, an, a device called a sonometer, which is something that measure, measures decibels that are created by something, so how loud something is. And so he put the sonometer a, a meter away from these opera singers and would have them sing, and he ended up finding out that they would create up to 140 decibels of, of volume just a meter away from them. Uh, and so just to give you an idea of how loud that is, a jet engine is about the same amount. Uh, and here's the other thing is, when we speak extern externally, we also hear ourselves internally. So it was even louder inside of their heads. And so what Alfred discovered is that these singers were singing themselves deaf. There was certain uh, strains that they were putting on their, in their inner ear muscles so they could no longer hear the pitches that they were trying to sing. And if you can't hear a pitch, then you can't sing a pitch. And so I think that this diagnosis of Alfred's is a bit like a spiritual parable for us today whenever it comes to hearing from God. Because many of us assume that this is a speaking problem on God's part rather than a hearing problem on ours. Like, we might just assume, you know what, if God wanted to speak, he could, but for some reason, he just doesn't. Maybe he's remote. We think of him as far off. He's uninterested in what's going on in our life. Uh, he's got more important things to do than to concern himself, uh, concern himself with us. Uh, or maybe we just assume that hearing from God is just something that super spiritual people get to do, not for someone like me. Uh, and so then even in Christianity, I think a lot of times within the church, we can be living off of the spiritual lives of others. Like we, we seek out certain certain gifted preachers and teachers so that we can be fed rather than hearing from God on our own. We just get frustrated with that, so we live off of someone else's spiritual life. But uh, this is why I'm glad that you are here today as we start this new series, Cutting Through the Noise. Uh, I'm Jonathan Cordell. I'm the executive pastor of ministry here, and today we're going to look at Luke 10. So if you have a Bible or a, a Bible app, open it with me. We're going to be in Luke 10 starting in verse 38. And here's what I think is important for us to know uh, as we start this series, is that if you follow Jesus, you can expect to hear his voice. Uh, in John 10, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. There's an assumption there that if you follow Jesus, if you're one of his sheep, you can hear the voice of the good shepherd. This is really good for us to know that God wants to be involved in our life, that we can listen to him, that he cares about us, and that he has made us so that we can partner with him as we walk through life. But we're going to find that God's voice isn't just this audible, disembodied voice that's speaking to us from a cloud, much to our chagrin, but that we actually have to learn how to listen to God's voice. And I've got a background in music education, and there's this, tr uh, 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 I've got a background in music, and there's a music education term called ear training. So whenever you're ear training, so if you can hear the feedback, you're ear training right now. <laughs> uh, so ear training is something where you're learning how to listen to the pitch and tell, uh, to a pitch and tell whether it's in tune or not. 
If a pitch is in tune, uh, it, it's just a subtle, small difference sometimes from whenever it's out of tune. And so when you're in ear training, you're trying to listen and be able to tell what's what. Uh, now, for some people, they just are naturally gifted and having a good ear, you can hear when something is in tune. But for many of us, it takes a lot of work. At first, it takes a lot of concentration to have your ear trained in this way, but eventually it just becomes second nature. And I think the same is true uh, in life with Jesus. Many pe there are some people who just seem naturally gifted at being able to hear from God. For most of us, we have to learn uh, what that's all about, learn how to listen to Him in our everyday life. Uh, so next week, that's what Pastor Christie's going to help us do, learn, uh, help us to learn how we can recognize God's voice. But for today, we're going to focus on our problem with hearing from God, which is that noise is normal. We live in the midst of a really loud world every day that we are inundated with voices, demands, priorities that distract us from hearing the frequency of God's voice. And so that's why this is really important for us to turn to the scriptures. And so today we're going to learn from a couple of Jesus followers. Uh, again, I said, Luke 10, starting in verse 38. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, a couple of interesting things that we should pay attention to in this story. First is that this is Martha's whole idea to begin with. She's the one that extends the invitation to Jesus over to her house. And she assumes that she needs to be doing all of these things for Jesus rather than be with him. Why is that? Well, I don't think it's entirely her fault. During this time, it's really common for women to kind of be in the background working on entertaining while the men are doing their thing. And so this is what she wants to do. She wants to have, uh, she's got this important rabbi that's over. And for most women during this time, the, uh, uh, what they can really hope for is that whoever their guest is is going to give them kudos for a job well done entertaining. That's like about the best that they can hope for. But when she comes to Jesus saying, hey, isn't this a problem that Mary's not helping me? He flips the script on her. And he says, actually, Mary's on to something here. Uh, like her simple desire just to be with Jesus where he is, this is more important to him than Martha rolling out the red carpet treatment. And I think this is a really good thing for us to notice is that one of Jesus' love languages is quality time. He likes it when we are with him. Now, there's something also scandalous about this, that Jesus is allowing a woman to sit at his feet while he is giving instruction. This is really just not the practice of the majority of rabbis during Jesus' time. And in fact, he's lifting up Mary as this star student. He's saying, we should follow what, what her example is, and here's what we learn from Mary, is that we have to stay near to Jesus in order to hear him. We have to stay near Jesus to hear him. It kind of sounds like a bit of an obvious uh, statement at first, but I think Martha's mistake is really instructive for most of us. I mean, how many times do you just have your own agenda, your own plans, and you simply want Jesus to be an accessory for accomplishing that? Like, if Jesus could just get on the same page as me, things would be good. Uh, but here's the problem with us, with Martha, is that many of our goals, many of our aspirations, they are far less than what God's best for us is. And I think with Martha, she can come off looking a little bad <laughs> when you read this passage at first. Like, she kind of 
just seems like, oh man, like she's got this epic fail here. But I think actually what Jesus is doing with Martha is empowering and it's redemptive because he's saying, I don't want to just use you as a means of my entertainment. In fact, Martha, you are someone who is worthy of investment. And so I think for many of us today, we need to recognize that Jesus doesn't want anything from us, but that he simply wants to be with us. And so then the question becomes, am I in proximity to Jesus? Every day we make that choice. Am I going to be close to Jesus or not? And so Mary, she's the one that makes the correct choice. Now here's the thing. In Martha's defense, she does what many of us do. She is at work serving Jesus. She's helping out. And this might be a lot of us today. Like we are just, we love being active. We love helping other people. That's what we naturally gravitate towards. And after all, like if you invite someone over to your house, you want them to have a good experience, right? If you invite someone over, you're not going to just put out like hot pockets and ramen noodles on the table unless your guests are toddlers and college students. You know, you want them to have a good time. And so here's what we need to note that Jesus is not pitting serving against listening. It's just the problem comes whenever we serve at the expense of listening to Jesus, when our activity distracts from our attentiveness. We want to be attentive to Jesus with us. And so as followers of Jesus, the reason that we serve is because that's the example that Jesus gives us, right? Serving shows the the character, the nature of God. And so Jesus, you'll notice when you read the Gospels, he's got a full schedule. He's got a full plate all the time. He's doing, doing, doing. But he always has this attentiveness, this presence with God. But some of the mistake comes whenever we do things for Jesus rather than with Jesus. And this is the model that he shows us and how he interacts with God the Father. John 5 is this great story where Jesus heals a lame man at a pool one day. The problem is that this is on the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath, there's all these strict rules of how you observe that. Jesus is breaking those rules. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they let him know about it. They they take him to task. And so this is what Jesus says to them. This is the rationale that he gives. He says, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. This is Jesus' sole focus in his earthly life is being near God the Father, paying attention to what God the Father is up to. We think of Jesus, man, he's got got an edge on us because, you know, he's the son of God. He's got divinity kind of going on for him. But Philippians 2 tells us that he lays down his right to be God whenever he comes on earth. And so he is just paying attention to God the Father. And so then when he's at work, he's simply doing what he sees God doing. This is why Jesus is able to use the Sabbath as this way of being present with God. So he's just saying, God, what are you up to? That's what I want to be at work doing. The Pharisees, they have settled for much less than God's best, right? The Sabbath for them is about themselves, their own performance, their own agenda, their own accomplishments, whatever they can earn on their own. So the Sabbath and how the Pharisees observe it, it leads to pride for them. With Jesus, when he observes the Sabbath, it is this way of experiencing healing in God's presence. So I think this brings up a good question for us, which is how much would you do differently if you simply did it with God? Like in the United States, it's, it's basically our religion to always be busy, to always act, have activity in our life. Because like the Pharisees, we are really about our own accomplishments. We're really about doing things on our own, filling up ev- every part of our schedule that we can. I love what uh, Dallas Willard says, that grace isn't opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. But we have very much an earning mentality in the United States. 
And we don't even consciously choose to live this way. It's just kind of in the air that we breathe. And so we're just doing what everybody else is doing. And I know I could just speak for myself here. Like there are times where I run the risk of getting overwhelmed with the tsunami of information and demands that are coming at me every single day. Like I, I'm in a time of my life, a season where thinking my own thoughts isn't really a thing because I have a one-year-old and a two-year-old. So like quiet isn't something that I always get around me. Uh, so then whenever I take my work and family responsibilities and then I put in like what we call adulting, like taxes and laundry and uh, doing groceries, I can have all this activity in my life that's drowning out the frequency of God's voice. And I, I just know that I am not the only one in this room today who's, who's struggling with that. And so this is why uh, Mary and Martha's example is good for us to pay attention to. And so today we're going to, uh, as we explore how we can hear from God, let's just spend some time diagnosing our hearing problems so that God can remedy them. And so the scripture highlights this truth that spiritual hearing problems can be both internal and external. So an internal hearing problem is really something that's sourced from me. Uh, so it's really within my control to change. That doesn't mean it's an easy thing to change. It's just, it's within my power to do so. External hearing problems are just uh, things that we have to live with. We didn't choose them, but we do have to choose how we respond to them. And so I'm going to just list some of these, see what might uh, resonate with you, but also maybe there's something else that's not on this list that you're recognizing. This is preventing me from hearing hearing God's voice right now. Uh, first internal hearing problem, as I've mentioned, is our agenda. Like, we get tunnel vision. We get locked in on something. This is what happens with Martha, right? Verse 40, it says, Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Jesus tells her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. Like, how much is that you right here. Are you like Martha, where you focus on the details and distractions over discipleship, over being near God? And so, you know, when you get locked in on something that's in your agenda, sometimes it can be like this compulsion where you are just not satisfied until you have whatever it is that you're looking for. So this can be something in your career at work. Uh, it can be like dreaming up the perfect house, like what you want your house to be like. It can be finding uh, the right significant other. And so it, you like, it's like your golem in the Lord of the Rings, where whatever is in your agenda, it becomes your precious, and then you will stop at nothing until you get whatever that is. And I'm so glad I don't have this problem. I just know other people that do. That's why I'm able to describe it so well today. So that's number one, our agenda. Number second internal hearing problem is negative self-talk where rather than hearing God's still small voice, that you just have this internal monologue, a voice that is constantly tearing you down. Uh, like you might think, man, God would never want to be around me or speak to me with my past, the things that I've done. I'm not good enough to know God. Or maybe you're parroting these words that someone else has spoken over you. And so you need the mind of Christ. You need, you need the, the power of God to break the lies of the enemy in your life. So even if that's you, I want to encourage you to receive prayer for that after uh, the service is done. Uh, number three is selective hearing. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Like for some reason, when, you, when it's time to brush your teeth, your child needs to be told multiple times until they do it. But whenever there's cake, you only need to tell them once and then they're on it, right? Uh, and here's the thing, as we talked about, Jesus' inclusion of Mary is disruptive for the accepted way of things. You know, and this is true when Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees. Like, they have something to lose when Jesus is challenging them because they're the ones that control this whole religious system. And so I think we need to face this uneasy truth today, which is that sometimes we have selective hearing whenever it comes from hearing God. Like, we are not exactly sure if we want to hear God's voice. Because if we do, then it's going to mean that he's going to challenge us, uh, challenge a way that we live, an area of comfort in our life, or an, like an idol. And so what it means is if we're going to hear from God, it means the end of our own control. But whenever we relinquish control, that's whenever we can start to receive 
God's best for us. So those are some internal hearing problems. External hearing problems, one I would to say is like the expectations of others. You know, Mary and Martha, they are subject to the expectations of their broader culture. And so in Roman culture, women just learn, hey, I am not valued here. And so we all have our own cultural expectations that we live with every day. So maybe you are a parent and you feel like you've just got to do everything to set up your child for success. You've got to really help them out in life. And so with all that you do, you just feel like this is never going to be enough. Or maybe you've j you're a student at school and you just always feel like under this crushing weight of outcompeting others that you have to achieve so much in order to get ahead. And so that it just feels like hard to wake up every day with all this burden of expectations that you have. And I think it's easier than ever now in this day and age to compare ourselves to others because of social media. We're all, always seeing these idealized versions of life and we just somehow don't match up to that. But this is what I think is really beautiful about Jesus' embrace of Mary and Martha, is that in a world where they are expendable, Jesus shows them how they are valuable. And so many of us may just feel like a cog in the wheel uh, uh, that we just need to get on board unless we, uh, or else we're going to get run over. But Jesus wants us to know you are not expendable. You are valuable. He wants to be with you. He wants to partner with you in life. Uh, the other external hearing problem I'll just call noise pollution. <laughs> uh, you know, Mary... She has Martha on her case. Jesus is always dealing with the accusations of the Pharisees. Uh, right now, there's an organization that I found really interesting. It's called Quiet Parks International. And so one of their goals is to help solve the problem of noise pollution. And they said that, uh, no, uh, that quiet spaces are on the verge of extinction in the United States. That in fact, 97% of the US population has chronic exposure to noise noise pollution. And the problem with this is when we're exposed to a lot of noise, it depletes our energy. It takes a lot of our focus and attention. That means that it's bad for your stress levels, which means that noise is bad for your sleeping, and which means that you're going to have chronic fatigue because of noise pollution. And then it's no surprise that research shows that constant exposure to noise actually increases cardiovascular disease. Now, we live in a noise-polluted world. Like, I don't, I don't think I have to convince anyone of that. And especially, we're in an election season, so we're going to have all these voices that are shouting at us, trying to get our attention. And even, like, with any moment that we could have to ourselves, we've got these screens that follow us around everywhere. And here's the thing. Noise isn't always bad, right? Like, coworkers, family, friends, like, these are good blessings that God has given us. The problem comes whenever it all drowns out the frequency of God's voice. So as we just went through that list, I want to ask you, which of the, what, what barrier are you facing right now in hearing from God? This is what we're going to talk about in our life groups this week. We're going to name those things that are preventing us from hearing from God so we can do some spiritual ear training and learn to listen to God's voice. So as I said, Pastor Christie will help us with that next week. But today, I just want to give us a bit of a starting point for hearing from God. Uh, and this, this is the words of uh, Pastor Rich Villadas, and it's this, befriend silence. Befriend silence. If you re rearrange the word listen, it spells silent. And so this, in my own life, when I meet with God, I found it's really helpful to begin with just silence, resting in God's presence where I don't have to do anything, I don't have to say anything. I simply am placing myself in a place where I'm becoming aware of God's presence. And so I know we've got busy lives, and so I'm not saying we have to become like monks all the time, but just like, when's some space that you would normally be bored, but you're using a screen to kind of stave that off? Like, why don't we just learn to spend some time in silence, or even in our time, if we start our day reading scripture and, and some time in prayer with God, just spend that time uh, li having little pockets throughout the day where we recognize God's presence. Uh, 
Pastor Rich says this, the more familiar you are with someone, the easier it is to be silent in their presence. Which makes me think, our inability to be silent with God just might reveal how unfamiliar we are with him. So this is why in our services, too, we want to we wanna make space to hear God's still, small voice speaking to us, where we want to rest in God's presence. And so if that's something that you've never done before, it tends to feel like an eternity. <laughs> Anytime that there's like space, you're just waiting for the talking to start again, like you're waiting for the silence to be over. Uh, and here's the other thing is I think for most of us, when we start just resting in God's presence in this way, you feel bad at it because you start to realize just like how much internal noise there is having it. But there's no way to achieve anything with this. It's like we want to pay attention to whatever God is bringing up, and God is going to, we can trust that God's going to meet us where we are. Uh, And so maybe there's an area of your life that you're worried about, and you just use this space to give that over to God. Maybe there's like a to-do list starting to be written in your mind, so you start to write it out externally so you can pay attention to God. Uh, And in silence, what we're starting to do is we're Recentering the eyes of our heart on Jesus. And so being trained in these couple of minutes every day helps this to happen in the rest of our day where we're able to refocus our attentiveness on God so we're doing things with him instead of just for him. And so, uh, so today we're going to conclude by coming to Jesus at the communion table. This is a place where we can experience his presence. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to have us just spend one minute of time resting in God's presence. We're going to practice this right now. So I'm going to set my handy dandy timer on my phone. And so I want to encourage you to close your eyes. And and maybe even you want to put your hands in a receiving posture, whatever you need to do to just kind of be attentive during this time. And so, Jesus, we thank you that right now we're in your loving presence. And so we just spend one minute resting with you. There it is. That was one minute. Resting with Jesus. I don't know how that went for you. Some of you are like, probably like, I wanted to leave. It's, <laughs> it was terrible. Uh, others of us, it felt like, wow, this, I could use a lot more of this. Uh, wherever you are, like, that's where you are today. Like, God will meet you where you are. Jesus today is making this invitation for us to be near him in his presence, where we don't have to do anything, we don't have to be good at anything, we're just with him, wherever we are, like in our state today.